On this edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at the Great Commission. The Great Commission is a call for each one of us. And if we go through our whole life having neglected this call, we will come before the judgment throne discovering that in many ways we've, we've wasted our whole life. So Luke is the one who wrote the Acts of the Apostles. <clears throat> and Luke begins the Acts of the Apostles by speaking about the fact that Jesus spent 40 days appearing to his disciples before he ascended into heaven. He spent 40 days, and towards the end of these 40 days, he told the disciples, you need to wait in Jerusalem, and you're going to receive the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, and you're going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to come to you, and you're going to receive power. And then you're going to be my witnesses, beginning in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the world. And then it says that Jesus was lifted up. He ascended into heaven. And then there were these two mysterious characters, these two men in white garments. I'd love to spend the whole morning talking about these two men in white garments. They're found throughout the Bible, these angels. But they say to the disciples, why are you standing there looking at the sky? And this is oftentimes, this, this question by these angels is oftentimes referred to in terms of a call to action. Jesus didn't come, become man, preach the, preach the good news, die for us, and then resurrect so that we could just stand there and look at the sky. That, that's not, that wasn't Jesus' plan. His plan, like we heard, is for us to go, beginning in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the ends of the world. You know, there's a lot of people, they like spirituality. Have you ever met someone like that? Oh, I'm into spirituality. I like reading books about spirituality. I like feeling spiritual feelings. Well, that's great. So do I. But if you're not doing anything with that, it's useless. There's no point sitting around looking at the sky. Go. And we, we hear this. We hear this. In Mark's gospel, for example, Jesus says, just before he has ascended, go into the whole world and proclaim the gospel to every creature. You know, I like to spend time alone in the bush in the Quebec wilderness up in Canada. And sometimes I, when I'm alone, I like to proclaim the good news to every creature. The frogs and the birds and the trees and whatever else is out there, you know, hallelujah! Jesus is Lord! Every creature needs to hear it. And Jesus says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, and whoever does not believe will be condemned. It's an important mission. The salvation of souls is dependent on it. And this command to go forth to the ends of the earth, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, make disciples of all nations. This command is called the Great Commission. It's called the Great Commission, and every single disciple of Jesus Christ, every believer in Jesus, is called to this mission. That's why it's called the Great Commission. Every single member of the body of Christ is meant to participate in this mission in some way. Now, some people say, well, listen, my gift is in preaching, you know, like I'm a shy person. I can't be part of that Great Commission. Well, again, we hear in Ephesians... Paul telling us, but grace was given to each according to the measure of Christ's gift. And he gave some as apostles, others as prophets, others as evangelists, others as pastors and teachers to equip the holy ones for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. And so, yes, every single person is called to this mission. Every single member of the body of Christ, every single believer and each one of us is called to it according to our giftedness. 
It's kind of like if a country is at war. Not every single person is going to be fighting on the front lines, but every single person better be assisting in some way. We call that the home front. In a war, the home front is just as important as the front line. Feeding the soldiers, strategizing, communication, building machinery, whatever else. And so too in this mission of bringing all people to the love of God the Father through Jesus, through His redemption, every single person is meant to participate in this according to His gifts including, you know, those who are contemplatives, you know, like the, the contemplatives, say the, the religious sisters who spend their, their life in contemplation and prayer, their job is to back us spiritually. They intercede for us. A religious contemplative or even a lay contemplative person, again, doesn't live a life of contemplation to enjoy nice spiritual feelings. A person of contemplation, of, of interior prayer, that person's call is to intercede for the mission of the church. And we have these great contemplatives like St. Therese of Lisieux who understood that. They were backing the mission of the church through prayer and sacrifice and fasting and all that. So don't get me wrong, even a life of prayer is, is, is a very important part of the mission. Now, this call or this uh, impulse, this desire to want to tell the whole world about God, about His love, about His Son Jesus who died to save us, this is something that you can't teach. It's not something that's taught, it's something that's caught. When a person has an authentic encounter with the risen, living Jesus Christ, the person automatically wants to tell everybody. It's a sign of authenticity. And so too, when a person is baptized in the Holy Spirit, when she receives the Holy Spirit, she wants to immediately go and tell the whole world. And that's the nature of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is sent. The Holy Spirit is always moving. The Holy Spirit is by nature dynamic. You can't receive the Holy Spirit and hang on to the Holy Spirit and hope the Holy Spirit doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't work that way. The Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes to us, the Holy Spirit wants to take us and send us. Kind of like wind. One of the images of the Holy Spirit is the image of wind. You don't take wind and keep it. You let the wind fill your sails and carry you. And so again, an authentic empowerment of the Holy Spirit is by definition a call to be sent and to get in on the action. Have you felt that in your life? Have you felt the, have you encountered Jesus and the Holy Spirit and you feel this impulse to be sent? There's so many beautiful scriptures that speak about this. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says, for the love of Christ impels us. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14. Isn't that beautiful? What impels me? It's the love of Christ. It impels me. So many of the missionary religious orders take that as their model. Why do we go to the ends of the earth? Because the love of Christ impels us. In Jeremiah, this beautiful passage, Jeremiah 20, verse 9, Jeremiah receives God's word, and he tries to be silent. He says, I say to myself, I will not mention him. I will speak in his name no more. But then it becomes like fire burning in my heart, imprisoned in my bones. I grow weary holding it in. I can't endure it. I can't hold it in. Like it says in the Acts of the Apostles, the Apostle says, it is impossible for us, this is Acts 4 verse 20, it is impossible for us not to speak about what we have seen and heard. Have you ever experienced that? Maybe when you had your first encounter with Jesus, when you were first filled with the Holy Spirit, you get together with your buddies. And all of a sudden, like, you got to say something. And there's just this, this desire. It's like, listen, I don't care about the football game or the hockey game or, you know, the latest gossip. You need to know about Jesus. 
You need to know about the power of the Holy Spirit. Have you experienced that? And finally, St. Paul, he says, If I preach the gospel, this is no reason for me to boast. For an obligation has been imposed on me. And woe to me if I do not preach it. Paul says, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. Love impels me. It's like if you were stuck on a deserted island somewhere in the South Pacific and, um, and everyone with you, uh, you say there was a, a, uh, the ship, you know, a boat, a boat sunk and you swim to this island and no one can find water. So everyone's dying of thirst. And all they can do is lick the, the dew off of the leaves in the morning to get a bit of hydration. And you happen to find in the middle of the island a spring with clean, pure water, guess what? You got to tell everybody. And so too, those who have drunk from the living waters of the Spirit, you got to tell everybody. And the reality is, is that, you know, there are, there are many people who call themselves Christians and Catholics who don't have this, this urge, this desire, this impulse. And again, it can be taken at, like, have you really personally encountered Jesus? Have you really been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Because if you have, you can't help but to preach the gospel. I mean, some Christians, Catholics, you can barely even get them to go to church on Sunday. You know, it's like the mom who yells to her son and says, get out of bed. It's Sunday, you have to go to church. He says, I don't want to go to church. She says, it doesn't matter. It's Sunday. You got to go to church. He said, why should I go to church? I don't have any friends there. The music is awful and the preaching is boring. And the mother says, it doesn't matter. You're the pastor. You need to be there. <laughs> we will continue with the teaching by Father Mark in just a moment. The Food for Life ministry is only made possible by the financial donations from you, our viewers. We ask that after the program, you prayerfully consider a tax-deductible financial donation to help us continue this Catholic television ministry. To save postage, you may now make your donation online. Just go to our website and follow the link. Thank you for your prayers and support. And now back to Father Mark Goring. The Lord Jesus in Luke chapter 10, verse 2, he says, The harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. So ask the master of the harvest to send out laborers for his harvest. And you know, in, there was times where people saw this call as a call to pray for vocations, you know? We need more priests. We, mean, we need more nuns to go work in the vineyard. But the truth is, is that every single Christian is meant to be a laborer in the Lord's harvest. In some way, this is a call for all of God's people, including the lay people, to rise up and let's build some ki kingdom, brothers and sisters. Every one of us is called to this work one of my favorite scriptures is Luke chapter 12, verse 49, where Jesus says, I have come to set the earth on fire, and how I wish it were already blazing. Isn't that beautiful, that Jesus expressing his desire? I have come to set the world on fire, and how I wish it were already blazing. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Don't put that light under a bushel basket. Bring it to the whole world. Now, there are three stages in the growth of discipleship. You've probably heard this before. And they're similar to the stages of a child learning how to eat. When a child is first born, first you need to feed the child. First you are fed. Then the child learns to feed itself. And then finally, the child learns to feed others. Older children can feed their little baby brothers and sisters. And there's a similar kind of parallel in the spiritual life. When you're new to the faith, when you first begin in the spiritual life, first, you need to be fed. 
You know, you need to go to church and hear homilies. You need to listen to CDs. You need to, you know, to have Christian brothers and sisters who, who feed you, who teach you, who, 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 who uh, nourish you spiritually. But then you should get to a point where you yourself learn to feed yourself. You learn to have the disciplines of, of reading the Bible, of listening to God's Word in your heart, of finding other good spiritual books. You learn the good resources. You learn to feed yourself. I hope most of you are there. You know where to get the good stuff. You know the good books. You read your Bible. You can feed yourself. But that's not the end. The end is that we should be feeding others. And so often, we, we, don't, we don't get that far. We get as far as, as, you know, being fed and maybe feeding ourselves a bit, but we're scared to take that extra step of feeding others. You know, it's kind of like the person who says, you know, I encountered the Lord 40 years ago in a Bible study, and I've been going to that Bible study for 40 years. The same five ladies, we've been getting together for 40 years, you know? And it's like, dude, you got to... You know, you, you got to do something with that. They say the only way to keep your faith is to give it away, you know? Some people wonder, why isn't our prayer group growing? You know, well, invite people, you know? It's kind of like people, you know, who, and we experience this in the charismatic renewal. Some people, they've had their upper room Pentecost experience. Remember the, the disciples on the day of Pentecost, they were in the upper room, and the Holy Spirit ca came down, they were filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit. But they didn't stay in the upper room. They went out into the streets and into the whole world. And I think, you know, if you find a, I gotta watch what I say here, but if you find a charismatic prayer group that's been meeting for 30 years with the same people, they're stuck in the upper room. They gotta get out. You know, they gotta get out and, and, and preach the gospel. And same thing with the grace of the Holy Spirit, the Lord pouring out just the manifestations and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the healing. You know, talk to anyone who has experience doing evangelization work, doing, you know, uh, work in, in the charismatic renewal, and they'll all say that the Holy Spirit is poured out most powerfully and in a most manifest way, you know, where you get the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in situations of evangelization. And I've done a little traveling around myself, too, and I've experienced the same thing. Like, if I'm invited to speak to a prayer group that's been the same 30 people praying together for the last 30 years, and we pray for the Holy Spirit, not much happens. I mean, there's always the one person who right away falls down, you know, but I don't, I'm not sure how real that is, you know. But if you go into a prison or into, uh, you know, a youth group that has some new kids who've never heard the gospel, and you preach the gospel, and you pray for the Holy Spirit to come, wow, power, you know, uh, manifestations. Or if you go to countries where the charismatic renewal is just beginning, and this is the first time they hear about this grace of a new Pentecost in our church today that the popes have been talking about, when they experience that for the first time, wow, power, signs, wonders. Why? Because we're going out. It's so necessary for us to go out and to bring this to uh, all peoples. It's the same thing, you know, I used to work with university students. I was a university chaplain. And there was lots of Christian groups on the campus, all kinds of them. And there was two types of groups, I would say. There were the clubs, the Christian clubs, and then there were the missionary groups. Some of the Christian groups, they were basically clubs. You know, people would get together and hang out, and they were kind of inwardly focused. Some of them didn't even bother looking up to the sky. They just looked at each other or looked at their belly buttons, you know. And those groups, they didn't grow. They weren't making a change on the campus. Then there were other groups who were very intentional and strategic, who defined themselves as missionary groups. And they were very intentional about meeting people who had never met Christ and bringing them to Christ and teaching them to do the same. And those were the groups that had the life, that were growing, that had an anointing on them. And of course, with my students in the chaplaincy, I kept insisting, this is a missionary group. 
I'd always give them a hard time in the beginning of the year when they would ignore the first-year students. I'd say, listen, if a first-year student comes in, their priority, you, you welcome them, you, you ask them their name, what they're, you know, where they're from and all that, you know, and you have to tell people that because our culture, we, you know, we're kind of like sheep, you know, stay together, stay together, ignore people, <laughs> you know. Some churches can be like that too. You know, you hear people, you know, I went to a church and no one said hi to me, no one acknowledged me, you know, and it's like, what's the point, you know? Are we a missionary group here? Do we have a focus on the lost, on the stray, on the prodigal sons? Is that our number one desire? Now, the best model, I think, for bringing people to Christ, if there was one strategy that I think is the best of all, it's the strategy that the Lord Jesus himself used. Did Jesus put on big conferences? Not exactly. You know, did Jesus have a TV ministry? No. Just a little hello to our people from Food for Life. Good to have you with us today. Uh, nothing against uh, TV ministries. What did Jesus do? He chose 12 people, and he spent three years with them. And then he sent them out to do the same and so they say that Jesus' favorite equation is not addition, but multiplication. You know, Jesus focused not just on bringing people to, you know, to a place where they could feed themselves, but would call them to feed others, and that's what's most important. I just want to kind of drive home the reality, brothers and sisters, that this call to the divine commission, the great commission, is a call for each one of us. And if we go through our whole life having neglected this call, we will come before the judgment throne discovering that in many ways we've, we've wasted our whole life. And so many times in life, we, we, we're like, you know, the rally races where they have, they follow directions, you know, go one mile, turn left, go two miles, turn right, go 3.2 miles, turn right. And some of these rally races, one person gets off track and another person follows him and everyone gets off track. And the guy in last place looks at the direction and says, wait a minute, this is 1.2 miles and it says 1.5 miles. Goes a little further, wins the race because he didn't follow the crowd. We don't want to spend our whole life racing, you know, climbing the ladder and becoming more successful and more money to lose our family, our friends, our, our children, our, to lose everything and realize, I lost the race. You know, Jesus said, why do you spend energy working for what doesn't satisfy? And so each one of us, we need to look carefully at the map. Am I racing off in the right direction? Is my energy, is my heart, is my zeal being spent in the right direction? Because if not, we don't want to come to the end of the life, our life realizing I was on the wrong path. I lost the race. I want to be able to say, I fought the fight and I ran the race. And I want to hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come in and take your reward. For an audio CD or video DVD of the teaching by Father Mark going on, The Great Commission, we invite you to write to us. Our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y 2T8. When you write, ask for an audio CD or video DVD of program 1853. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at Restore Peace. And sometimes all it takes to kind of restore the child's peace and contentment is for the mother to hold her child in her arms, maybe rock her, and this child's soul and heart is stilled.
I have the great privilege of reading many, many wonderful letters that come to Food for Life. And so often I am completely blessed when I read some of the kind words that you share. It really touches my heart. I want to read a few of those letters to you today. The first one comes from a viewer who writes, Thank you for your ongoing programs. I find them enriching and a wonderful supplement to scripture studies in my faith journey. They often clarify areas I've been struggling with. Thank you again. Another person writes this, As always, Food for Life continues to be a strong weapon of the Lord in bringing His people to know Him more deeply and give them hope and trust they need to live in today's world and to have peace. The teachings on Food for Life offer us all a challenge to recognize the sovereignty of Jesus as Lord and King of the universe. And finally, another viewer writes and says, Enclosed, please find a contribution to help with the program. I'm alone and I'm in ill health. I cannot go out alone, but a family member takes me to church. When I return, I watch Food for Life, and I find it very inspiring and comforting. Thank you, and God bless you. I was so touched by these and many other letters that we get. We really do appreciate the feedback that we get, and some people even have suggestions. We appreciate all sorts of feedback. It really means a lot. And I'm hoping that as I've read these letters to you today, if you've been watching Food for Life for some time and you find that the program's a blessing to you, and if you feel that the Lord would lead you to support the program financially and in prayer, we'd like to hear from you. It's only through the faithful, prayerful, and financial support of people like you that Food for Life can continue. So if you feel so led, we'd like you to join us in sharing the good news. Please write to us at Food for Life. For an audio CD or video DVD of today's ministry, we invite you to write to us. When you write, mention the program number 1853 and today's topic, Father Mark Goring on The Great Commission. Food for Life is a nonprofit Catholic charity funded only by donations from viewers. To help us continue this Catholic television ministry, please send your tax deductible donation to Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y 2T8. To save postage, you may now make your donation online. Just go to our website and follow the link. We ask you to consider a regular monthly donation, either by post-dated checks or through our website, to help us continue the Food for Life ministry. If you have never donated before, we ask you make your check payable to Food for Life. And our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y 2T8. Thanks to your faithful prayers and tax-deductible financial support, Food for Life is the longest-running Catholic television program in Canada. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at Restore Peace. And sometimes all it takes to kind of restore the child's peace and contentment is for the mother to hold her child in her arms, maybe rock her, and this child's soul and heart is stilled. We would like to thank you for your financial support of the Food for Life television ministry. Food for Life is funded only by viewers like yourself. We have no commercial sponsors. Your tax-deductible donations help pay for production of the program, pay the television station for the time that the program is on the air, and pay for the mailing of our monthly newsletter. Thank you again for your support of this Catholic television ministry.